Hello, everyone. Welcome to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. This is episode 13. Today's guest is Rachel Paling. And Rachel is the CEO and owner of Newer Language Coaching, which incorporates professional coaching and principles of neuroscience into the learning process. She coaches and trains teachers worldwide and now has a network of over 800 neuro language coaches. Rachel has recently set up an education foundation called Newer Heart Education. She is also running her fifth annual Newer Heart Education Conference from the 14th to the 16th of May 2021. Um, I hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, everyone. Buckle up for a new episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast, the one and only podcast made to help you launch your business or take your existing business to a level of success you could never have imagined. Whether you're a school owner, freelancer, publisher, or other entrepreneur, you're sure to pick up lots of actionable advice when you listen to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Remember to visit eflmagazine.com for great articles and features. Without further ado, here's your host, the founder of EFL Magazine, Philip Pound. back everybody to the EFL magazine business podcast and today I'm delighted to have Rachel Paling on the line. Uh, Rachel is the what we say head honcho uh, CEO of uh, neuroheartteducation.com. She's got a lot of things on the go uh, and um, I'm really looking forward to speaking to Rachel today. Rachel, how are you today? I'm very well, Philip, and I'm delighted to be here and, and really uh, um, grateful to you for, for inviting me. Thank you. Oh, thank, oh you. thank you. Thank you. So we, we uh, unlike maybe a lot of the guests that I have, I've actually met Rachel. I had the great pleasure of meeting Rachel a few years ago at the Edufest in, in Millfield. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's not always you, we can say that in, in this particular world. Um, so... Rachel, tell me what uh, what you're doing at the moment and how life is for you. Um, well, do you know what? There's beautiful sunshine uh, streaming through the window this morning, and I'm extremely grateful for that. And today, actually, I've got uh, a rather relaxed day, which is quite unusual. Um, but working on a lot of things, and I think very similar to you, um, Phil, we're, we never stop. So... It's that continuous uh, development, creativity, plus the continuous day-to-day keeping up with everything that we have to do. Um, So there's teacher training going on. There's development of teacher trainers going on. And there's a lot of sort of writing in the background going on. Um, Also, very, very excited that in February we're launching this new foundation, the New Heart Education Foundation. So yes, a, a lot of things going on at the moment, similar to you. Okay. I uh, yeah. Well, I I can launch a podcast uh, just interviewing myself. I think I'll I'll talk about all the things I'm good at. <laughs> uh, it should be about five minutes. But uh, um, so tell me a little bit about the foundation. This is this is something new. It is. It is, and um, what many people don't realize, Philip, is that when I in 2008, when I sort of had the vision of what uh, I wanted to see in the future, the, the the real thing that I wanted to see was the foundation. And that was back in 2008 when I set up Efficient Language Coaching. And then when I started the teacher training in 2012, that, that vision of the foundation was always burning in the background. And um, for me, it is about um, bringing the neuroscience, bringing the heart science, bringing that holistic system, not only to teachers and and training teachers who can't afford training and schools and institutions and places that can't afford it, but also looking at developing homeschooling that really comes into applicable knowledge 
And, you know, giving children firstly language knowledge that they can go out and use, but also questions about how do they use mathematics? How do they use biology? I think all of us share that we had that experience at school where we had no clue what anything was applicable for. We still don't know a lot yeah. of things. Long division. There you go. Take, take that one away. Oh, gosh. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so so that's, that's going to be the, the real essence of this foundation and the homeschooling program that we want to bring out. Even, even things like entrepreneurship for kids. Things like that. You know, one of my coaches in the US, he's very excited because he, he's preparing that, that course and not only for teachers to give to kids but also for for kids to experience that that introduction to being an entrepreneur even from being a child you know so excited so excited so let, let's uh let's talk about that for a few moments because the podcast as we know is for business owners and entrepreneurs that are looking to branch into this industry or, or come from the uh, english language teaching or indeed language teaching industry so um how do you teach entrepreneurship? Is is it teachable? What are the, the skills that, that kids would need? Yeah, I think this is the question. And, and as I say, I have uh, the, the coach in, in the US. Joe is the expert on, on this and uh, does courses already with, um, I think, with uh, young adults, so uh, late teens, etc. cetera. Um, but I, I do think, you know, there are certain things that, Right from a young age, we can start to, even if we're connecting it to mathematics, you know, how to handle money, how to understand the movement of money, the value of things, um, you know, bringing children into that buying, selling, you know, this is how it works. Um, even, you know, the, the customer service skills of how do we speak to people? How do we communicate? That's something else maybe coming into entrepreneurial. Um, maybe later in, in the teens, we can come into sort of um, basic accounts and running that business and maybe all the different areas of business. You know, like I think um, a lot of us have learned about business on the ground. I think a lot of our, our listeners, um, language coaches, business English coaches, or whatever they do, have actually gone into companies and seen um, almost as a spectator how companies are run. And then there are those of us who actually are running our own companies. So, so yes, it's bringing children that idea that a company is not just about one person. It's about multiple segments of, of a business that have to be explored and, and when you're starting to look how do I expand you you're looking at expanding um not only treasury marketing services sales you know there's so much to a business that a lot of people don't realize and let's go back a little bit about you Rachel uh tell me a little bit about your your background your professional background and uh, how you got into entrepreneurship it's, it's quite interesting. You know, I always um, smile when I do look back. Um, we've heard that beautiful phrase from Steve Jobs, when you look back on your life, you start to connect the dots. And I think when you get to a certain age, that's what we do. So, um, Phil, as I'm implying, that means I've got to that certain age in life. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I definitely can see how there was that sort of pathway and and at the age of 17 when I moved to Spain and started teaching English at that age um it was quite a an experience for me because um you know I I did leave school at 16 although I went back to university and school uh, at the age of 24 25 so I kind of did things backwards I I became um an autonomous uh, worker at the age of 17, 18. Um, and in fact, a, a little secret that many people don't know, but now people are going to know. Um, I started my own business with my ex-husband at the age of um, 21. I, I was an entrepreneur at a very early age and we did run a business together. Um, in the background, I was still doing some teaching, but still, um, it, it gave me that basis of running a business. 
And later, as I said, I went back to university. I became a lawyer. Um, I hated it <laughs> because I actually wanted to be a human rights lawyer. So that was my uh, focus of law and still is in life. Um, and all the way through, all the way through my life, I was always teaching um, until then in the year 2000. Then I, I literally became uh, fully focused on, on teaching and, and languages, plus bringing in the law. Um, so in those early years, in two, between 2000 and um, about 2012, before the teacher training, that's when I was very focused on business English legal English uh, and very much that sort of um, coaching, developing that coaching of, of uh, executives and, and professionals. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so yes, I, I've had entrepreneurship all through my life. And, you know, it's interesting, Philip, I don't know about you, but they've always, I've always heard people say that once you have your own business, you can never go back to working for somebody else. Well, it's not really possible, is it? It's 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 a point of no return. I think. I I agree. I really do. I think you know when you start to get used to uh, taking the decisions, understanding what and how to move business, even if you fail, um, it, it's never that step to go back to work for somebody else. It, it just doesn't work. Yeah, is is it possible? Because the this we talked about this in in a previous podcast that you know some of the skills needed for working in in a corporate environment. Of course, there's transferable skills, and but people are are often what in silos, aren't they? Or people are compartmentalized, and they only know a certain amount of about running a business. Whereas being an entrepreneur. Especially at the beginning with a startup, you have to be able to do it all or, or learn quickly. That's right. That's mm. what you ground running. Yes, yes. And and yeah. tell me about your experience of that. So you, you had your first uh, business uh, at 21. So you, you didn't have much background in <laughs> working in corporate or working for for school. Did did you were you working for school at that time? No, not at no. all. It was a totally different business. Um, I, I was teaching from the age of 17 to about 21, and then um, it was a totally different um, business area. And for me, it was I was uh, very much involved in the sort of customer service and the running of the business. And um, my husband was involved in the sort of practical side of, of the business. So it was, it was interesting to have that combination of, of two people doing two different things. But it gave me the ground skills. And yes, absolutely, I was green. When I then came back to sort of being an autonomous, uh, let's say, self-employed person from, from 2000 onwards, um, that sort of then became a more steady step-by-step -step process. And in 2008 is when I founded uh, the limited company. And that's when I started with, I would say, a shell around me as you know as a as a company that was was expanding and growing but with no sort of clear understanding of how to do it and I really remember in those early years Philip the frustration because it was very much chicken and egg and I think it is uh, for many many people who go into the business of language schools or language training centers um, there's always that chicken and egg of at what point do I have to stop training? And when we get to the 12 hours of training every day, that's when we have to start thinking, OK, I can't do this anymore. But then you need to be able to transfer clients to other trainers. And you also need to have more business coming in for those other trainers. So there you have, you start to have that chicken and egg of how do I get more business in? How do I get more trainers? And, and there is that big question mark. And I remember clearly that period in, in my business and, and it wasn't an easy time at all. 
And little by little, uh, the, the business started developing. So then I was really able to onboard more and more trainers. Um, and by 2012, I actually had a team of 12. So uh, there were a lot of trainers running around uh, with you know, businesses and corporates um, for, for the company. And, and it was a very, very hectic, phenomenal time. But that actually gave me the, the space to then start to create more the, the teacher training. And that's when I started moving into uh, delivering the, the language coaching certification that, that we deliver. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about your business. So language coaching, teacher training, what else do you do? Um, well, I think that's the nucleus of everything, you know, and I mostly am focused on the teacher training at the moment. So developing the concept of new language coaching, um, really bringing this to teachers. And now there are 22 teacher trainers of neuro language coaching worldwide. And we're now starting to deliver in different languages. And these teacher trainers are, you know, they're phenomenal. They're now starting to deliver it in uh, German, Spanish, French, Italian, uh, Portuguese, Polish, Russian, Arabic, um, Ukrainian, Slovakian. So we're we're bringing it out now more and more into the different languages. But your your business is is not just language training, isn't it? We, we you bring in is it right to say neurolinguistic? Is, is that the right phrase, or do you have um, your own? Well, it's. <laughs> um, your language coaching is the combination of neuroscience plus professional coaching into that delivery of language learning. So it is about, and, and it's nothing to do with neurolinguistic programming. It's nothing to do with uh, anything that is sort of that sort of uh, persuasive language of, you know, not at all. What, what we are focused on is the hardcore science behind the way the brain functions reacts and learns and bringing that knowledge to trainers and, and teachers to to really modify firstly the way that we communicate it's absolutely key that we understand that the way that we communicate has an impact on the learner and secondly to be able to share with the learner what's happening at certain points of that learning process, or you know, are there any blocks? Are there any obstacles? And how do we coach around them? And then also helping people to connect very quickly with the language. And for me, the one thing, uh, Philip, is that's fascinating. Since 2016, we now know that when we learn a language, the brain goes to the native language structures first. And I know that because of all my language learning, I know that I've hopped from language to language. You know, I went from French and Latin to Spanish. I taught myself Spanish. Um, from Spanish, I went to Catalan. I taught myself Catalan. From Spanish, Catalan, French, Latin, I then went into Italian. I never had an Italian lesson. And from there, I went into German. And now I'm trying to, to use that sort of uh, the, the associations and connections to come more and more into Russian, to Greek. Uh, I promise I'll get to Japanese at some point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Well, me too. I, I'll get there at some stage. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do it together. We'll do it together. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's just bringing that knowledge to to trainers so that they can help their learners. And the more that we understand our brains, each and every one of us, the more we can help our learners to understand, the more insights we're going to have in that learning process. And then on the other side, we're bringing in the professional coaching and coaching. A lot of people think that coaching is just about having a chat and having a conversation and being a coach like a sports coach. But actually, it's not. It's, it's much, much deeper than that. And you come into the competencies of being a coach with the International Coach Federation. And when you actually go through those qualifications of becoming a, a life coach, it is not easy. And there is a lot to learn and modify again in the way that we communicate. 
And this is a conversation I had with uh, Rachel Roberts last week about coaching and and therapy as well as an excellent interview. So um, for those of you listening to Rachel's interview, we can have the other uh, Rachel we can listen to. Uh, Spelling's a little bit different, though. You She is the A-E-L, you have the E-L. Um, I'm not. Pardon? <laughs> She is the biblical spelling. Oh, I'm not. okay. <laughs> you you leave it out. But um, yeah. So for somebody who's uh, once become an entrepreneur, has already owns runs a business. Uh, so what kind of coaching could you offer to that uh, those kind of people? What kind of advice can you give from this perspective, from newer language coaching? Yeah, and the the one thing I would say, you know, from this perspective is that we're all different. Um, you know, it's about respecting that each and every one of us may do things differently. So whatever I say may resonate with some people, may not resonate with others. And it's about coaching is always that sort of trying to get people to find their way. So with anybody who's trying to set up a business, I would really say, see if you can find a business coach. So you can find somebody who is going to soundboard ideas with you because the the essence of, of a coach is somebody who brings out your ideas and your creativity and not forcing what I think you should do. Um, and, and that's the beauty of coaching, that it is about soundboarding. So my advice would be to, to try and connect with a business coach Bounce some ideas off. If you want some advice, then clearly ask that coach and the coach could then share um, things that have worked uh, for that person, but also share other things that have worked with other people because normally, uh, you know, when you have business experts, they, they have alternatives. It's not just giving one idea. Now, I, um, I think it was about 2014, I did, in fact, enroll in, in a program where I did have a business coach for a, a short period of time. And one of the most fascinating things that this um, program, this coaching program gave me was, if there is something in your business that you do not like, find somebody else to do it. And that was the best piece of advice I've ever, ever had in, in the business. And, and this is what I actually, you know, we, we, um, we support our neuro language coaches. We support them with marketing um, workshops. We support them with a little bit of business insight workshops. And um, this is something that when we are having those workshops, I, I often say to the neuro language coaches worldwide who, who themselves are um, what I would call mini entrepreneurs. They are mini businesses. I always say, you know, if there's something you don't like, if you don't like marketing, who could do it for you? Who could help you? Even if it's a teenager helping you. I mean, if you don't like accounting, who could support you? If you don't like sales, if you don't like creating packages or whatever, that's the best, the best advice I ever had. Okay, fantastic advice. So, Rachel, besides a business coach or a life coach, or in, in this case, business coach, what sort of a network, what sort of support group should entrepreneurs have or what would be so so for example should they take part in a mastermind group uh, what kind of uh, business networking should they do in, in your experience what what works what what's good it's actually it's an interesting question um for that because Firstly, I know that many, many, many of us, and I'm sure you will agree with me, um, it is that question of time. We have time to be in um, networks or in meetings. And, and I confess, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if they're going to be hearing me, but I confess I am actually in a, a networking group at the moment and I, I never get a chance to go to the meeting. So firstly, I would always ask the question, is there really a lot of time? And secondly, you know, um, what is it that I'm wanting this network for? Am I wanting it to bounce ideas off the group? Am I wanting it to um, get more business, get more contacts? And I think that the, the honesty card, I always talk about the honesty card in coaching, that, you know, I really need to be very clear what 
can this network bring me? Can it bring me expertise, contacts, or just um, networking? Hey, excellent. Yeah. So, so, so it's, yeah. it's the purpose of the group, isn't it? it? Do you want it to bring business or do you want some kind of moral support? So you have to know what you want at the outset. Absolutely. And how much time do you want to invest in that? And then does the, the time invested bring back the, the fruits that you're expecting from that group? So, yeah, so I think it's a, a, it's a good question. It really is. It's um, it's probably good, uh, better for some people than others. I, I'm thinking of a, an example of uh, somebody I know here in Tokyo. He's uh, he's a lawyer actually as well, and he's he decided to go to network group to you know get in clients, and one of the other participants is a jeweler, and he ended up selling everybody Rolex watch. So, huh? so that was wow. that was his business and so he he bought the watch and you know his wife wasn't so happy that he spent four grand on a watch but uh well, there you go so yeah if you're looking to sell jewelry maybe it's uh, it's good <laughs> it's been right. proven in one case but um bringing in business yeah it's maybe iffy but the the moral support because uh as a we have this portmanteau now, the solopreneur, or people who start businesses by themselves. And uh, so what what's your take on what, what's your opinion on starting a business by yourself or with a partner, which is better advantages, disadvantages? Um, you can hear that I've got this, this long pause here. <laughs> um. Personally, 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 I do think unless it is a close partner, and I mean sort of husband, wife, or, you know, but even then, I always say that partnerships are a little bit dangerous. And I always wonder if it's really, really better for each person to just be their little island, have their business, have people to support you around you. Partnership, you have to be very, very clear right from the outset. Who does what? What happens if there's a conflict? Um, and, and really have it in paper. You know, even going back to my, my legal training days, you know, so many partnerships that go wrong. And it's, it's soul-destroying because you have people that come together with such gusto and, and love for the business and getting it going. And then some years later, you see it, how it's absolutely gone sour and, and very bitter as well. And there, I think, because I've seen that so many times, that always I have that amber light of caution, caution, caution. Um, and, and I agree with you. I think, you know, nowadays, and especially with the pandemic, especially with what's happening, we have a lot of uh, teachers coming into becoming mini entrepreneurs. And there I would say to see how they can really do it by themselves, maybe getting a support network. I always say to my new language coaches that they can support each other. They don't have partners, but they can um, support each other and bring business to each other. Maybe they keep a little commission if they're bringing business to somebody else, but but they can still be their own island. And uh, uh, it, it, uh, well, actually, you know, I I'd been going it alone for what five years. Now I have a, a partner. The last few months, he's he's fantastic and. Uh, uh, I mean, it's taking the my motivation to new levels. It's really rejuvenated the company. His expertise and uh, his just success is is just pushing me forward. And uh, because after five years, you know, if if things aren't working, you can you can begin to hit a hit a wall, really. And that was uh, it. Just came at the right time. But I think. I, I'd been kind of circling around other partners in the past few years, and I'm kind of glad it didn't happen in, in, in certain ways that things didn't wor work out. Um, so because he, he's he's the best guy that, that yes. I, I, could, I could think of and um, we work really well together. So I'm 
as, yeah. as, uh, as somebody else related to me in, in an email, he said, whoa, you've struck gold there with him. So, um, so yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm happy about my partnership, but coming back to your, to maybe some stories you've in your legal life about failed partnerships what what's, what went wrong do you think is, is for, for people who are thinking about entering a partnership or are in one what what are things you've got to be aware of and you've got to act on before things get out of out of hand um, it has to be right at the beginning that clarity of who does what and, you know, I think, as you say, you've, you've found that magic formula with your partner. And, and that really is, you know, when you've got a business partner, um, at, at the beginning, everybody is very, very enthusiastic. Everybody is, you know, hitting the roof with motivation, whatever. But many people forget to get that solidity behind to say, right, fantastic that we're feeling so good about this let's just get it down on paper let's really really clarify this goes this side this goes this side this is what happens if we have a question or if we have a dispute or if we don't agree in the future at some point so I think it's you know in everything in life I think it's that clarity beforehand and not allowing those emotions to to run away with us because they do, you know, we 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 we're human, <laughs> and just having that that rational, logical brain first, saying great with the emotions, but let's just uh, clarify first. Because sometimes, if it comes from a friendship, that maybe you have a lot of things in common, maybe similar personalities, but these things mightn't work in in a partnership. You need maybe two different people, don't you? Uh, well, I mean, you know. There might be magic, magic formulas with friendship. There might be magic formulas with strangers. You know, it, it, it's about that, that. When you work together with people in a business, it's getting the spark for that business to move forward. And as you're saying, that's that's what you were, you know, you've, you've found it. And, and that's fantastic. And, then, you know, it doesn't matter if it's friends or family or whatever. As long as there is that magic formula and it's working, why not? Yeah, what what I wanted to say, uh, I should clarify, was uh, maybe if two people are extreme optimists, maybe that won't won't work well. Or if, if two people are, you know, maybe if there's an optimist and a pessimist together, that somebody who's maybe uh, less of a risk taker who, or who can see the possible downsides of things, that it's maybe a good balance in a company. From your coaching background, do you think that's... Uh, Better than maybe two optimists, two people who will spend, spend, spend. and I think I've moved it more into the realms of the brain. Instead of using optimism and pessimism, okay. pessimism is quite a negative word. So I think I'd use it more in terms of the brain. You know, if you've got two emotional people, uh, it could be good to sort of say, okay, let's just engage our rational, logical, prefrontal cortex first. Um, and then let's go with the emotions. So, so yes, I, I think it is. Um, you, you, it's great when you've got that optimism together and the positivity, and both people are bouncing off each other, and you've got the energy going. That's phenomenal. That's almost like for me, that's like the fireball for the business to to move and take off. And wow, yes, so I, I wouldn't want to lose that. And if I've got two people in a business like that, I'd be saying, go, go, come on. But at the same time, I'd be saying, right, guys, let's sit down. Let's just get it on paper. Let's just sort it out. And then go. Yes. Okay. Ex excellent. Excellent advice. So we talked a little bit about partnerships. So you're starting off uh, in, in your own business. It's, it's, it's a bit daunting. There's, you know, maybe overwhelming as well. Uh, how how can you cope with this sort of situation from your coaching background and from your own experience? What kind of tips can you give to people? Um, definitely, you know, as we were saying before, it is that sort of cracking the, the chicken and egg. How do I bring in more business? And then how do I bring in more trainers? If, if that's the sort of feeling of I need to expand or I need to offload because I think um, you and I know, and many of our listeners know that, you know, 
you get to a point where you are actually with so many clients. And, you know, in those years from 2008 to 2012, um, Philip, I kid you not, I was starting at 7 o'clock in the morning and I was finishing at 7 o'clock in the evening. The only breaks I had were when I was running from client to client and in the car from client to client. You know, that's when I'd have my lunch, driving to the next client or running through the corridors with an apple or whatever. And, you know, when you're working like that for a long period of time and you're trying to develop a business, I think that is really stressful and it, it is I would say the most intense period of developing a business and at some point you say enough you know at the weekends I'm doing my administration and the weeks I'm 12 hours running from client to client and now I definitely need and, and there it is that question of okay which are the clients that I would be able to transfer to new trainers and then how do I develop that? And then it's the, the question of, okay, marketing to get more business coming in. But the other side of a business, and, and this is also something that many, many people, um, I'm not sure how much we are careful with it. It's that cash flow. And cash flow is essential. You know, you have to make sure that that cash is flowing. It doesn't matter if you're not making money, as long as that cash is flowing. Because as soon as you get a stopping cash flow, wow, that's when you've got added stress coming in. And I, you know, I, I've been there. I know exactly how it feels when you're, you've got your, your head going slowly under the water and you're thinking, oh, my God, if that cash doesn't start flowing soon, help. I'm and sure think, I'm sure a lot yeah. of businesses have experienced that and and will do in the future and with with, with this covid situation it's you know mm -hmm. it's a, a lot of streams of income have dried up and people yeah. have this fear but how did you address that situation how how, how because that that's the the most important thing in business really. it is it is yeah. definitely mm. um, the first thing is um how do I tighten the belt so if there's a cash flow problem, what are the costs and expenses I can get rid of now? And then you really start offloading things that you don't need, things that you can squeeze on. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes that also might mean personnel if you've got secretaries or whatever. You have to tighten the belt. And then you have to see, what do I need to get that cash flow again? Is it somebody who's paying and then, they're, you know, they're not paying? We're, we're behind on payments. How do I get those payments moving in? How do I get new business? So there are various strategies of doing it, but definitely the first one is, what can I offload? That's the emergency stage. And then you start to look at the next stages, like how can I get stagnant money coming in and then, how can I promote and get more business? Okay. So moving on to getting more business. So you you launched your company, you went out on your own. You're you're now really successful. So I want to kind of rewind a little bit as to your origin story we'll go joseph campbell here and we will say you know you had your difficulties at the beginning and you you went through this uh, tough situation and now you've come out a, a changed character <laughs> at the end so tell me a little bit about your your difficulties how you overcame them and uh, what worked for you and what didn't um definitely it's been a long journey so there's been a lot of ups and downs and um, starting the business in 2008, you know, before that I was uh, um, self-employed. Then that transition into actually having the company and uh, developing the company. Um, when, when companies are flowing and going and we've got business coming in, I, I don't think we think about sort of the future. And one of my major, I'm going to say, um, perhaps blind spots was um, actually working very, very heavily with one particular company. And in those years, uh, 2008, 2012, perhaps 80% of the business was coming from there. 
So uh, in those years of 2012, 2013, that company started having problems. And when your major, uh, let's say, income is starting to have problems, that's when you start to realize, woof, I need to find other companies, other businesses. And, and luckily we, we did, but there were many moments of up and down. And I would say running a business is like social. Um, you, you have to go up with the wave, you have to go down with the wave, and you have to know how to surf. And I think many business people talk about this. You know, there are going to be down moments. There are going to be moments where you're thinking, whoa, how do I get out of this? And I would say I've hit, I've hit a lot of downs. You know, it hasn't been plain sailing. And um, thank you for, you know, that comment that, that you're seeing success. Uh, I'm, uh, I personally, I, I still feel, you know, there's, there's so much more to, to do. And, and for me, you know, I, I always question what is success? You know, from the outside, people see what they want to see, but they don't see the every day that you and I are experiencing. They don't understand what, what battles we're, we're, we're facing behind the scenes. So business is, is interesting because obviously people see what they want to see and people comment on what they want to comment. But, you know, in the background along the way, and when I started with the neural language coaching, you know, there was a lot of skepticism from the beginning. I, I think I was one of the first to really talk about neuro. Um, a lot of attacks, um, especially people saying, hey, you're not a neuroscientist. Well, how are you talking about? Neuro, and by the way, now I am a neuroscientist. I do have my master's in neuroscience. But, you know, you know just what people don't understand, and, and I talk about this with my teachers, is that social and emotional pain that we all experience as human beings. And, you know, when people were attacking me, and there were some from, from the uh, English world that were heavily going into those attacks, and publicly, by the way, um, it, it hurts. It hurts. And, you know, as an entrepreneur, I even had to have at one point, I had a, a, a kind of call with my business coach saying, hey, I'm, I'm in pain. What do I do? And, you know, you, you, you learn to kind of accept that some people will agree, some people won't. And that's fine. Everybody has their opinion. For me, what's important is helping those teachers who are ultimately helping their learners. And, you know, for me, it's about how can we all understand our brains more? Philip, if I'd have understood my brain earlier in my life, what a totally different life I would have had. And I honestly, goodness, if I, you know, when I look back and I look back at my brain, the reactions, the emotions, what I did here, what I did there, it was like, oh, wow. Now I understand so many things. And if we can bring that gift to young people, even to children, I do think that we need to be talking to children about their brain and, you know, how to manage ourselves as human beings. And if we can bring teachers to really bring this message more and more to children, to other adults, um, you know, I, I, I've sat with, with middle-aged uh, ladies and gentlemen Talking about fight or flight and what's happening and what can we do and what strategies can we build up, and especially with language speaking. We had one lady uh, with one of our coaches in Milan, with Sophie, and this particular lady in business meetings, she would never talk because she was terrified. And we're talking about so many topics, attitudes like this. And with a few sessions with Sophie, one, meet, one meeting, she walked into that meeting and she started talking. And she, she gave the feedback to Sophie that they nearly all fell off their chairs because she was speaking and she was speaking confidently and well. And, and that isn't the fact that she learned the language from one day to the next. That's the fact that she took control of her brain. She, she managed her emotions. She managed her confidence levels and she went in there and she did it. So, yes, I think, you know, running the business has been ups and downs. You learn to surf the waves. You learn to accept. I think, I think you learn to really accept that, you know, there may be many things happening. 
and maybe maybe we need to go back to being a little bit that sort of uh, Socratic uh, Greek philosopher mentality of you know uh, just accepting acceptance. Uh, stoic stoicism, I guess, is the answer to everything in life. Okay, <laughs> well. In, we're, we're, We'll we'll come on to that uh, in a moment because uh, it's an area I'm very interested in, but uh, and and maybe related to that as well. A, a problem people have, uh, will have, may will have in entrepreneurship, but in life, whatever endeavor it is, if you are reaching some level of success, you're going to get detractors with this. This is something because if you want to have success, this is the wages of success, isn't it? You're going to get people that don't like what you do. And absolutely. And, you know, I think it is coming back to to that. It, firstly, it's, it's the understanding of the social and emotional pain that we all feel. We all feel it. We all get upset, even if it's, you know, friends, family, whoever is having, uh, you know, criticizing us or whatever. So um, the, the real question is, how do I manage my reaction? I cannot manage the reaction of other people. And if other people go into uh, joy or hate, <laughs> I, I have to then sort of, in some ways, I have to detach from that and, and just accept and allow them, and, and honestly, I, I now I just don't react to it. So it's it's for me, it's about, and it was a learning curve about how to manage my reactions. And if somebody goes off on a rant, fine, you know, it's it's their problem in the end. And I I do think you know everything comes back to each and every one of us managing our brain. And it's been my journey of understanding how to manage me. Okay, so let's 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 dig down into that managing your brain. So we have a, a situation. You're getting some negative feedback. Uh, what can you do? Um, firstly, I would be you know really checking into what is the negative feedback, um, and I actually might even be going into you know I'm really sorry that you feel that way. And and for me, a lot of it is about the compassion for the other person who is feeling that because that is what they are feeling. So often uh, with these, I have responded, you know, I'm really sorry that this is obviously affecting you. And then uh, it could be that sort of, well, you know, maybe there is something that I can add to this scenario so that you have a different sort of understanding of it because it may be that misinterpretation from, from that side. Or, you know, uh, that question of, okay, well, what do you want me to do about it? And, and really balancing it to, to that person, if there's negative feedback from that side, well, you know, how can I help? What can I do? How can I make it better for you? So instead of me bouncing into my reaction of, oh, my God, <laughs> no, me actually turning around and saying, well, you know, firstly, I'm, I'm sorry about this, that you're having this reaction, and obviously there's something behind it. So may I try to understand what's behind it? And then when I understand what's behind it, what can I do to help? Or maybe I can give you a little bit more of a clearer clarification or information to, to help you to understand more the situation. Yeah, e excellent advice, because the, the natural reaction is to get defensive, isn't it? And, and, <laughs> and then, you know, <laughs> personal attacks and be, it, it just becomes very childish, doesn't it? What you then have are two people exploding. And each side is exploding in their reaction. And then you have that sort of distancing of both sides. Whereas if one party is not reacting, that person who is reacting, literally you're just saying to them, well, you know, keep going or, or let's sort it out. And it, it is. Everything in life, Philip, is about how we react to it, each and every one of us. 
And this is something within our gift. Is this is something within within our part? Getting back to the stoicism, we have, uh, you know, we can't control how what people say about us or how people think of us, but we can control our reaction to it and and our response to them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So you, we we talked about your journey. You you had the difficulties and. Tell me about the success in 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 your company. Tell me, you know, about how many conferences, trainers you have now, and uh, how you got there. What the magic formula is? Um, again, I'm, I'm going to say it really depends on what the definition of success is. <laughs> um, for me, success is when somebody says to me that they've had good feedback from their learners. That to me is the, the, the greatest form of success. And I always say to trainers and teachers that do my course, your best feedback is going to come from your learner, not from me. It's going to come from the learners and from your, you know, the people that you're working with. So the more I hear their success stories, for me, that is the greatest success. Absolutely. Um, conferences, yes, I mean, you know, we all speak at conferences, so I think we're all successful with that. And um, I think it is that sort of, you know, it's connecting with people. The, the one thing I will say, um, Philip, before this pandemic hit, um, 2019, I really, really forced myself traveled all over the world to to bring out more and more the message do the training and for me it wasn't so much about being successful at conferences for me it was about bringing the message about the brain to as many people as possible and wherever i went um, in south america i was doing free talks as well to schools to universities to anybody uh, you know where we set up those talks to bring this knowledge to the trainers to the teachers so that they could then bring it to learners and for me that year was key and and the success for me was bringing that message out so that more, more people could manage themselves and understand their brains understand this emotional reaction that we all have and I do think, you know, I look back at that and I think, thank God I did that. Because now with everything that's happened in the world, I know that there are many people out there who, who do now have an understanding of managing their emotions. Because we're living in a world where, where today, you know, everything is triggering all of us. So for me, success is more about positive feedback and bringing the message out. That's my measurement. And, and for me, the, the setting up the foundation. Um, a lot of people think, you know, I've had also a lot of comments of, oh, my God, she's raking in the money. God knows what. I don't want anything from it. And what people don't really understand is that I live a very, very simple life. Um, it, it, it's not about me. You get to a certain age in life where it doesn't, it doesn't matter. If I, I don't need things in my life. And, and that being able to be a social entrepreneur, that for me is success. Where, you know, last year we did the uh, Neuro Language Coaching Conference and we did it online. And I'm going to say 75% of those proceeds, because the other 25 went to, towards costs, 75% of those proceeds have been used to set up this foundation. And for me, pumping it back into something that's going to be of service, that's going to try to help, and especially now today, that for me is success. That rocked my boat. So I, I think for any of you who've listened to previous podcasts and, and future podcasts, this is a, a common theme. People... Uh, I haven't asked, asked Rachel this. I don't think I have to. But uh, where does money come on, on on your list of priorities? And it's down there, maybe 
third, fourth for for most people I've I've talked to. It's 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 about the the satisfaction of doing a good job, getting the feedback, and you know, uh, changing people's lives. Yeah, absolutely, mm. yeah, absolutely. I, I, can, you know, I, I can see in, that. Mm. Yeah, in a business, realistically, we need that cash flow. It's like a river. You need to have the cash flow, and the cash flowing then starts to pay people who are working in that business, paying the teacher trainers, paying everybody. And, and for me, money is about circulating it. It's not about retaining it. It's about circulation. And now what we've done is we've opened another river of circulation into the foundation. And, you know, again, we'll be doing the conference this year and again, the proceeds will be going into there. So for me, it's about, uh, I'm, I always think it's about being, could we say the, the, I'm trying to look to the right word, the manager of that flow. I don't need to have that money flow in my let's say, in my presence, in my life, I need to keep it flowing. I need to keep it going. And, and that is, I think, at the moment, for all of us, it, it's about keeping everything going. That's the key. So for me, money is very, very low on the retention list. But as a, you know, that, that vision of the, the river flowing, that is the vision to keep it going and flowing and for for those of our listeners we're, we're talking to rachel paling of uh newerhearteducation.com uh, if they want to go down the career path of being a coach how do they go about it with you um it is very much focused on um neural language coaching mm -hmm. and it, as we said before, it is this bringing in not only the coaching side, the professional coaching, but also the neuroscience, the brain-based learning approach. Um, the first step is to, to take part in the neuro language, the efficient language coaching, language coaching certification program, which is one of the only certification programs accredited by the International Coach Federation. And in that course, then they, they really come to, to transform. And it is a transformational communication uh, and all that information coming into the, the language process, the language learning process. Uh, definite structure, we do things differently. We have two types of goal setting where we have mechanical mastery goals. So yes, it is a very different approach to what is the normal approach and bringing in that, those coaching skills. Now, um, if they wanted to go deeper into that path, there is an advanced course after it, which is also accredited by the OCF. And with the first course and the second course, quite a few of uh, my neuro language coaches have then used the credits from those courses to develop themselves as a life coach with the ICF. And quite a few have done that, yes. If they then want to go on to the teacher trainer path to actually be teaching my uh, neuro language coaching course to others in the world, um, there are two more courses. There's the professional your language coach, which actually goes a little bit wider. We then go into culture and language strategy and things like that. And then finally, we have the, the teacher trainer course where they are literally habilitated or facilitated to uh, have the license to then uh, train your language coaching to other trainers and teachers. That's on the one side for it. Now, on the other side, we also have another course which is accredited by the ICF which is called neuro language communication. And this is in fact for any teacher, for maths, physics, and you know, any person who is involved in training development, you know, even in companies. And this course combines the neuroscience and the coaching without the language element. 
And that's something else that we're also developing now in the world. Okay. So the last question I'm going to ask you today, Rachel, is uh, what's for the future? What's... Um, Valentine's Day will be very, very special this year, everybody. <laughs> because we are launching the NeuroHeart Education Foundation. Ah, okay. Not the heart. <laughs> so that is definitely in the future. Um, we're coming into launching the foundation. The foundation will be not only about training teachers, but also homeschooling. I've never run a foundation before in my life, Philip. So this is going to be another learning journey uh, for, for me and for anybody who is going to be accompanying me on that journey. So. Yes, uh, continuing with the training, continuing with this development of helping people to understand communication, managing the brain, bringing it together in learning, and really trying to reach um, people who are affected, um, not able to afford education, or people who are affected by the pandemic and need that extra support with the with education. So, and, and for people who want to be volunteers, are there some? Are you accepting volunteers for your um, foundation? Definitely. You know, we we already, um, we already have some volunteer projects where where some of the new language coaches are actually uh, coaching for free. Um, we have one um, foundation that we're working with in in India where we're helping teachers there. And also um, some of the coaches are helping children in Italy with learning difficulties. And they're volunteering and and helping for free with that. And that program, that volunteer program will be coming into the foundation. So yes, Um, and we will be looking for, you know, some teachers, trainers, educators in other areas like uh, nature, science, etc., to create that curricula. So yes, there are teachers and trainers. The one thing I do want to say for that, my idea with the foundation is that um, all the teachers and trainers who are delivering services through the foundation will get paid, and the funding that we receive will go towards the payment of those teachers and trainers and coaches. And the children or the the teachers receiving will be receiving free of charge. So for me, again, it's about that circulation of actually, yes, uh, you know, providing work, which is being paid for. um, But the end product is actually being received um, for nothing. Um, And and that's my vision of, of making this foundation work. Okay, and on that note, we'll end it today. Um, so it's Rachel Paling, and Rachel is on neurohearteducation.com. What's the best way you're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all the usual channels? I am. Uh, yeah. LinkedIn, Rachel Marie Paling, uh, Facebook as well, uh, either Rachel Paling or Rachel Marie Paling. And definitely, uh, if anybody wants to send an email, info at efficientlanguagecoaching.com. Um, with pleasure, you know, I'm very open to to feedback or to people who are interested in in helping with the foundation, you know, and um, Instagram as well. Uh, with oh yeah, Instagram, yeah. Coaching, mm-hmm. um, or me, Rachel Payne. So yes, delighted to connect with people all over the world. Okay, Rachel, thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast with Philip Pound. For more great advice and resources, check out EFLmagazine.com. If you found this podcast helpful, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. See you next time.